how we represent, that's how we, um, that's how we accept uh, intuitions, empirical intuitions. So think of it, this analogy, and I'll stop with this. Um, I find this, when I was an undergraduate and I first came to Khan, I found this helpful. Um, so if somebody asks you, what's the shape of some liquid, like water or orange juice, what's the shape of it? And the answer depends, obviously, on the container that it's in. So as it were, in itself, by itself, the liquid doesn't have any particular shape, but it takes on a shape because of how it's contained. So in our experiences, we supply the shape, so to speak. And that shape is spatial and temporal. So we know, a priori, that whatever liquid gets poured into that cup, whatever empirical experience we will have, we know something about its form. And we know that a priori. OK. The next section is so-called transcendental analytic. Um, this is the theory of understanding, the theory of understanding as opposed to the theory of sensibility, theory of sensation. And he makes a kind of analogous argument here. Um, so now Kant, um, Kant is interested in our um, the form of our understanding or our knowledge. Uh, rather than our empirical experiences. Um, and Kant's argument here is very difficult. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail at all, except to tell you what he's trying to do. Um, and his argument changes. This is a place where his argument really does change between the two editions of the critique. Um, so what he's trying to do is ask how it is that we take up our intuitions, how it is we take up our experiences, and make them into knowledge, make them into um, judgments or claims. So um, and the answer is we do this with the categories of the understanding. Um, and he has, as I say, a couple different strategies for doing this. Um, but there's a similar picture where we can know a priori the general form here because we provide it, regardless of what the, what the specific content is. Um, so here, one, two, three, four, five, sixth quote, the second from the bottom, summarizes the sort of upshot here. He says, our cognition, our thoughts and our judgments, arise from two fundamental sources in the mind. The first of which is the reception of representations the receptivity of impressions, so that's like we're open to um, experiences from the world. So that we're open to um, the empirical um, content that comes from experience. So the first is the receptivity, the reception of representations, the receptivity of impressions through inner and outer sense. And the second is the faculty for cognizing an object by means of those representations, spontaneity of concepts. So we provide concepts, as it were, that apply to what we receive from the empirical world of the sense. Through the former, through receptivity, uh, an object is given to us by what? By the world. Through the latter, it is thought in relation to that representation. We provide the concept. We apply a concept to that representation. Intuition and concepts, therefore. Intuition, one more time, is basically our receptivity. And concepts are our, you would say, spontaneity, our deployment or application of concepts. Intuition and concepts, therefore, constitute the elements of all of our cognition, so that neither concepts without intuition corresponding to them in some way, nor intuition without concepts 
can yield a cognition. So, so thoughts, cognitions, involve the use of some concept that we supply and some intuition that we get from experience through intuition. And you need both of these. Because if you have just concepts alone that we deploy, if we just had them, they wouldn't be grounded, they wouldn't be applied to anything in the world. And if we just had, as it were, object or impressions of objects from the world, we wouldn't have any concepts to apply to them, we wouldn't have knowledge. So he says very famously, without sensibility, without sensations, uh, no object would be given to us. And without understanding, none would be thought. So finally, thoughts without content, concepts without objects, are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Okay. The longest part of the critique of pure reason and the part that's typically neglected is called the transcendental dialectic. Um, and what he's doing here is arguing basically that most of the doctrines of traditional metaphysics are mistaken. And they're mistaken because they are attempts to use the concepts, sorry, they're attempts to apply the concepts of understanding to objects beyond possible experience. So that is, what he's trying to show is that the concepts, sorry, the categories of the understanding and the forms of intuition that we can know a priori, like mathematics, geometry, uh, the um, categories of the understanding, which I'll mention in just a second, um, do give us, do give us genuine a priori knowledge, but only when applied to objects of possible understanding. So that's the idea of critique. That's the idea of limiting the deployment of this pure knowledge, this a priori reasoning, to its proper domain, namely objects of possible experience. Um, but Classically, metaphysical objects, for example, God, the soul, the universe as a whole, these are what metaphysical claims are typically about. And they are not objects of possible experience. We can't have an experience, an impression, an empirical impression of God or of the entire universe, or of our soul. And therefore, for Kant, we can't have a priori knowledge of those things. So the very first quote that I read, read you here is, was that human reason, by its nature, has is pressed to ask certain questions, like, for example, about the existence or nature of God, but that it can't answer. And now you see why. Because pure reason is able to generate genuine knowledge, but only of objects of possible experience. And the traditional metaphysical uh, claims are of objects that go beyond possible experience. Um, so we cannot have knowledge of In some cases, uh, as that first quote suggests, we're tempted to try to apply the forms and categories to objects that are not objects of possible experience. And when we do this, when we try to think about, well, I'll give you an example, when we do this, we wind up with contradictions. 
you wind up in the mess that is traditional metaphysics. So for example, if everything is located in space, if we know a priori that everything has a spatial location, we're naturally led to ask, where is God? Where in space is God? But Kant thinks we can't answer that question um, because God is not an object of possible experience. And space is the form in which we experience objects. We know that a priori, but if this is something that is not experienceable by us, it's not going to be found in that form. It's not going to be located in space. No possible experience of God, so no answer to the question, where is God located? The, this question, you might say, exceeds the limits of pure theoretical reason. We're led to ask that question, but we cannot find an answer. Is that clear? Okay. The case that we are especially interested in here is the so-called third antinomy. The particular contradiction that matters a lot to us that comes from applying the categories of the understanding beyond objects of possible experience. And this is um, the antinomy, the contradiction, the traditional metaphysical question that comes from, uh, as I say, attempting to apply the categories of the understanding beyond possible experience. This is the one in which reason is driven to postulate, to assume both freedom and necessity. Um, so the question here is, is there freedom? Is there spontaneity? Or is everything determined by a necessary cause of some prior, um, prior event. Um, so I'll say something more about this in just a second, but what, what's the strategy, what's Kant's answer going to be here? I mean, he thinks that, he think context that we know, a priori, that in all of our experience, there will be a causal necessity. So that we take as a, as a postulate of what scientific investigation, empirical investigation, that we look for an explanation by trying to identify a prior cause. And even if we're unable to find it for sure, there is one. OK, so this is one of the categories of the understanding, causality. And how can there be freedom if everything is determined causally? So if we know a priori that everything is going to be determined causally, how can there be freedom? Okay, so what's the strategy going to be? How can we know anything a priori? How can there be substantive, uh, substantive a priori knowledge at all? if it's knowledge of if it's knowledge of experience so for Kant we know that everything is going to be located in space all objects of possible experience so where is God? well not in space because not an object of possible experience Okay, so we know that all events are going to be causally determined, even if we're not unable to identify exactly what the cause was. Where is freedom? Where is something that is not causally determined? Is a spontaneous, uncaused cause? exactly the same trick. It's exactly the same reply. So, so 